Welcome everyone to the Society of Thoracic Surgeons General Thoracic Surgery Database um, monthly webinar. Today is Wednesday, June the 8th. Um, oops, I need to change that from user group call to monthly webinar, so I'll get that changed. Um, so welcome. Let's see here on the call with me today from the STSI. We have myself and Carol Crone and Emily Conrad and Sydney Clinton. We also have Ruth and Katie from our core group side. And Ruth is, of course, our GTSD consultant. Um, from the IQBA team, we have Jean and Joe and Steve. So thanks, everyone, for joining today. Um, I'll provide a quick STS update, then I'll turn things over to Ruth, per usual, for um, her education portion of today's webinar. Um, I'll give a super brief IQBA update. We don't have any, actually don't have any updates from our last webinar. Um, and then, as always, we'll finish things up with your questions and feedback. Um, please be sure to submit your questions uh, via the Q&A function and not the chat. Um, I can monitor the q and A. I'm a lot easier than um, trying to tackle both, so I appreciate that. Again, um, just please feel free to put those questions into the Q&A. Also, if you'd rather raise your hand um, to discuss or um, clarify a question or just to, if you'd like to chat with us directly, um, just uh, use that raise hand function and we can get you unmuted and um, have a chat. All right, so let's go ahead and hop in for STS updates. The training manual for June should be posted by the end of the day today. It's in the hands of marketing. So Kasha um, will get that posted on the website for us as soon as she is able. Um, again, hopefully those um, that update will be posted by the end of the day today. Um, so look out for that. The spring 22 analysis results, um, we did get an update from IQVIA earlier this week, um, are coming soon. So those reports are expected to be available by the end of this month. So please know that we will send a formal communication to the GTSD community as soon as these reports are available. Um, again, thank you for your patience um, on these reports. I, we realize the delay is not... It's not been very helpful, but again, um, these reports will be available for you by the end of this month. Also, the updated analysis overview um, that I reviewed on the last call will be posted and available along with this report release. So uh, again, a formal communication will be sent out to you all when these reports are available, and the updated um, analysis overview will be posted um, to coincide with the release of these reports. <clears throat> We do have a 2022 audit um, brief update. Again, for anyone that wasn't on the last call, the audit notification letters um, were emailed to selected sites. So if you have not gotten an email from Emily, then you were not selected um, for this year's audit. Um, audit instruction for those that were selected, audit instruction letters um, were sent as well from uh, CRS, our audit company. And also, if you're curious about the audit process or would like to see um, the variables that are being audited or just to get an idea of what's expected if you for a future audit, the STS audit website has been updated with the 2020, 2022 audit details. Um, also, another um, audit update that I just wanted to provide information on um, the post-procedure verification, um, we do have an update to this. Um, we were, for those of you that were selected, you were notified that um, we would be looking at two variables for the post-procedure um, verification. We would, um, in that initial notification, you were, um, the two variables that we had indicated that would be um, required for this um, for this verification, it's going to be the readmit 30 disk sequence 3930 and MT30 stat. Um, we have made a change to that. So that now that the only variable that we will be looking for for this post procedure verification will be the um, MT30 stat variable. So again, only the MT30 stat sequence 3950 um, will be required to have 100% agreement rate um, for this audit requirement. Um, again, if you have any questions, just let us know. Um, but again, um, STS and the audit company will be following up with a formal communication regarding this change in the audit policy for those sites that were selected. So you will be getting additional notification um, with this update. Um, GTS public reporting, no news. Um, as of yet, again, the next update is still scheduled for this summer. We'll, re we'll utilize results from fall 21 harvest. 
Um, any questions regarding public reporting should be directed to Sydney Clinton, and Sydney's email can be found here, sclinton at sts.org. Um, again, more information regarding public reporting will be coming out soon. And again, if you have questions, um, just please reach out to Sydney, and she is happy to get those answered for you. Um, I give you a platform access. Again, if you are adding new user accounts or deactivating, um, you need to deactivate current users, um, please complete the STS participant contact form found out on the STS website. Um, I have the link here. Um, if you have any questions about completing that participant contact form, please reach out to us at STSDB at STS.org and Addie would be happy to help you um, with that form. Uh, AQO 2022, uh, again, as you all aware, Providence will be held in Providence, Rhode Island this year, October 26th through the 28th. Um, the general thoracic session will be held on Wednesday, October the 26th. Um, I am happy to announce that the AQO abstract submission page is finally open. So we are currently accepting um, submissions for abstracts this year. Uh, please, I really do encourage you all to submit, um, get an abstract submitted for GTSD. At the, last year, we did not have any GTSD abstracts um, at AQO, and we really would love to have some of those um, GTSD represented this year. Um, submissions will close on Tuesday, July 5th. If you have any questions about the abstract submission process, um, please contact Emily directly. Um, also, let's see here, I think Emily, um, I have a link here to the abstract submission page, but I think Emily could probably put it, if you would put a link into the chat box, um, and I can also show that as well. Hold on, actually, let me do that here. So let me pull this over real quick. Um, for the AQO abstract submissions, if you just go to, um, I think it's under, on, oh shoot, Emily, where is it? At, under meetings, go to live courses and scroll down to 2022 advances in quality and outcomes, a data managers meeting. Am I going to, yes. So if you, from this page here, you can scroll down and get um, all the information for 2022 AQO. Here's the information for, um, to submit an abstract. Um, click here for the view abstract guidelines and click here to submit your abstract. Um, additional information regarding COVID. Um, if you would like to get your name added to the interest list for when registration opens, just click this button here and fill out your information and you will be um, included in the email blast of when um, registration opens. So all of that information is available for you at all meetings, live courses, and just select, um, scroll down and select 2022 advances in quality and outcomes. All right. Um, in regards to AQO, sorry, oops, sorry about that. Um, AQO planning is underway. We have had our first uh, meeting and I just wanted to provide um, some ideas of some of the topics that we've been discussing for this year's AQO. Um, we've been looking at um, some of the things we discussed was uh, were preoperative evaluation, risk factors, um, understanding PFTs, echo, et cetera, um, case scenarios for lung and esophageal, um, cancer, path reports, staging. Um, we also discussed post-op complications, um, using data to improve outcomes. Um, we had a request for hernia repairs. And then also um, we had discussed an audit um, talk, system, um, an audit discussion um, going over systematic areas, errors and um, having a data manager give, who's participated in an audit um, give a presentation on their experience, I guess kind of the how-tos and how to survive an audit and um, best practices for audit. So these are just some of the ideas that we're currently discussing for um, this year's AQL. We would love, again, love to get your feedback um, on additional topics. Please feel free to put those into the chat here. We'd love to get those here. You can put them in the Q&A. You can email me, you can email Ruth. Um, but our next call is, um, I believe it's next month. I believe, I don't, I don't have the date off the top of my head, but again, we would love to get your feedback and your ideas on areas where you're struggling and you would, um, you would really like to see an AQO this year. We really want to make this um, this year's AQO you know, most beneficial to you all. We really want to provide um, education and presentations on things that you really want to hear about in areas where you're struggling. So again, please uh, you know, give us feedback and specifics 
Um, again, you can put them in the chat here, Q&A, email myself or Ruth. So we would love to have your ideas to bring back to the group next week or on our next call. Um, so that would be that would be most helpful. Um, let's see here. I think that's all that I have for STS updates. And again, just the harvest schedule, the um, fall 22 harvest is underway again. We just encourage you to submit your data early and often. And this fall 22 harvest, again, does include procedures up through 630 of 2022. All right, that's all that I have. So next I'm going to turn things over to my friend Ruth. Um, so Ruth, um, the floor is yours. Gillian. Hello. Sorry, my voice is a little scratchy. That's right. Uh, okay, so first request. Um, if you all could remember when you fill out your FAQ mailbox submissions to please, please double and triple check that your email address and your database version that you've entered are both correct, that would be extremely helpful. Um, the way that it works is that when you submit your question to the FAQ inbox and then I reply, um, it automatically goes to the email address that you enter in the box. And if that email address isn't correct, sometimes um, when the, uh, the message gets rejected for the error, it doesn't always go to a place that's super logical in the system. And so it can cause some pretty significant delays. Um, oh. Sometimes I catch it quick and sometimes I don't. Just depends on how the system sorts the, the rejection. The database version helps us assign it to um, the correct um, team for answering the question, whether it should go to congenital, adult cardiac, or the GTSC person, which is me. Oh, Ruth, one, one thing. Thank you for bringing this up. One, this is Carol. One thing I also wanted to add in is that in the sequence number box, if there's anything other than numbers or letters, it will it will reject it and not send it into the FAQ mailbox. So if you add a comma in between multiple sequence numbers, it will reject it. So just make sure you only enter in um, you only enter in numbers or letters. And it's okay too if you have a question about you know that some some sequences are sort of go together. Like is this a post op event and what grade is it? It's fine if you just put one sequence number in. You don't need to slash it or, or put in an ampersand or anything. Um, just put in the initial sequence number and then I'll be able to answer your question. Okay. Thank you, Carol, for that. Thank you. Sorry. Going on mute. Um, so now we're gonna get into some of the FAQ updates for June. This isn't all of them. This is just a selection. So be sure to check the training manual when it gets posted this afternoon and the FAQ summary. Um, but first, a few slides on sequence 580, which is reoperation. Um, so based on changes that were recently made, capturing a current case as a reoperation requires two criteria be met. The first one is, did the patient have a prior surgical procedure in the same operative field? If not, then the current case is not a reoperation. You can stop right there. If there is a prior surgical procedure in the same operative field, then is there documentation, usually in your op note, that the current operation was more complex because of the prior operation? So this is sort of the look for documented lysis of adhesions, et cetera. So I'm going to the next slide. Um, I did add an additional clarification um, this month for patient, uh, to provide guidance for patients that have had a prior endoscopic procedure. So diagnostic procedures not requiring incisions such as bronchoscopy or EGD are never considered prior operations. So they wouldn't meet that first criteria from the previous slide. So if you have a patient that had a bronchoscopy as part of their diagnostic journey for their lung cancer, and then that patient has a lung resection, you wouldn't count that as a reoperation, even if there's documentation of adhesions. The adhesions could be from something completely else. So a significant infection or uh, radiation treatment for breast cancer, for example, um, and we wouldn't want to count those as reoperations. Um, so this is a polling question about sequence 580 particularly. So patient is a 65 year old male with a past surgical history of a cabbage in 2020. He went to the OR today, we're gonna pretend, and had a left upper lobectomy for a T1A and zero M0 lung adenocarcinoma. The surgeon notes lysis of adhesions in their operative note. How would you code sequence 580 reoperation with that information? And I don't think I can see the 
numbers, Leanne. So whenever people have answered, feel free to. Yeah. Okay. We are, we're still going. Let's say, let's say we're about 50, 50 on the answer so far. That's a good question. We're still going. Give it just a few more. It's like we're slowing down. All right. It looks like we've got, we got about 75 people that responded. Okay, okay. So let me, all right. And pull and share results. So the correct answer is no, this would not be considered a reoperation. If you want to advance to the next slide, Leanne, there's some sort of information about why it's a no. Um, oh, I didn't realize I have to close the little question box on my screen so I can read yours. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I didn't realize that on my end. Um, so the, um, the cabbage is a procedure within the pericardial cavity. So the thoracic cavity is subdivided into the superior mediastinum, plural pericardial cavity within the mediastinum. The decision of the STS when this version of the training manual was published is that each of those sort of sub cavities of the thoracic cavity is considered separate. So um, a procedure that occurs within the pericardial cavity is not a procedure within the same, um, the same cavity as the pleural cavity, which is the example um, that's in this case scenario. I think one of the other examples that's already published in the training manual is um, an example of a patient that had a lung resection, esophageal resection. Those are also not considered to be in the same cavity. All right. <clears throat> um, sequence 590, history of cardio cardiopulmonary disease. In May, the training manual got updated to clarify that documented regurgitation was sufficient to code cardiopulmonary disease. Um, and that's just a snippet of that FAQ right there. Um, for June, um, based on feedback from data managers, the language underneath each type of valve disease was cleaned up to align with that May update. So under aortic valve disease and um, any other valvular disease sort of subtopics, I just lined through that section um, C so that it doesn't uh, conflict with the May clarification. Hopefully that's helpful and not more confusing. The next slide, um, sequence 750, FEV1 predicted. So this is an example of, an, of a PFT report where you can see that the pre, um, so the FEV1 is the second line in this report, FEV1 liters, so the actual is 4.60, the predicted was 4.63. This person has some beautiful lungs. Um, the pre-bronchodilator values are on the left. They did not actually do post-bronchodilator PFTs for this patient, um, <clears throat> but if they had, um, you can see that the percent predicted for the post bronchodilators at this institution are never listed. All they list is the percent change. And because of the way that PFTs are completed, and I frankly don't understand all of the science behind this, you can't add the percent change to the percent predicted of the pre bronchodilator value and come up with your post bronchodilator value. You actually have to do the math. So you'll take your actual, um, post bronchodilator volume and divide it by what the predicted was to come up with your percent of predicted for your post. Um, there was confusion based on um, the example that already existed in the training manual, which said um, that you're supposed to code the highest of the two. And then the example that we gave was for a, how to calculate a pre bronchodilator and um, sites wanted to know if they could also use a calculated post bronchodilator value and, and you can if that's the higher one. The intent of the example was to show you how to do the math, not to indicate that you can only use a calculated um, pre bronchodilator value. Next slide. A couple of clarifications for 1470 procedure. I've gotten lots of questions this month about um, how to code multiple segmentectomies. Um, there is not a code specifically for a section of multiple lung segments. So you'll code either 32669, which is thoracoscopy with removal of lung segments, or 32484, which is the open um, correlate of the thoracoscopy um, for segmentectomy. So uh, based on how your surgeons perform the procedure, you only have to enter that procedure code once, regardless of how many lung segments get removed. Um, 
there's a lovely article that I found that's got like videos and all kinds of really cool stuff um, talking about how uh, left apical trisegmentectomies are performed. It's far and away the most common um, multiple segmentectomy that gets performed for anatomical reasons. If you look at the um, picture on the right, you can see that the the apical segment and the posterior segment and that anterior segment on the left sort of come out together. And then what you have left is the lingula on the left. So they're sometimes called lingular sparing left upper lobectomies. And that's just the same thing as an apical trisegmentectomy. And you would code the segmentectomy codes, not the uh, lobectomy code. Next one. Um, so 1530 and 1540 were updated to align with direction given on uh, lung cancer cases. So the intent of the FCS is to capture this data for cases that are new primary esophageal cancer resections and new resections of a thymoma, not um, resections of recurrent disease, similarly to the way that um, we are now directed to only abstract new lung cancer resections. Next slide. Sequence 1560, we, um, which is hiatal hernia, diaphragmatic hernia, or GERD, but um, really the intent is only to capture hiatal hernia. So even the title of this sequence is a little bit confusing, to be honest, in the training manual. Um, we've updated or provided clarifications in the training manual that indicate that the only hernias that need to be captured are diaphragmatic or paraesophageal, um, or are, I'm sorry, hiatal or paraesophageal hernias, not diaphragmatic hernias. However, the information um, on diaphragmatic hernias remains in the training manual for educational purposes. The intent of the education is not to imply that the diaphragmatic hernia should be abstracted. You'll want to follow the clarifications directing you not to include these cases. Um, sequence 1800, clinical staging of lung cancer tumors in size in centimeters, which is a long sequence title. That's a long, long name for sure. Um, in May, the training manual was clarified to indicate that for mixed density lesions, we were supposed to indicate the tumor, the solid portion of the tumor size in centimeters. In June, I added further clarification that if the nodule is purely ground glass, as the nodule in this image is, um, that the documented size of the tumor in centimeters would be zero because there is no solid component. Next slide. Um, sequence 4140, which is regarding unexpected escalation of care. The intent of this sequence is to capture changes in patient status as indicated by your ADT. So this is sort of these messages that go through your EMR that indicate the patient's sort of leveled status. So the most common ones that I'm familiar with are GMB, which stands for general medical bed, IMC, which is intermediate care. Some institutions call, I, call IMC PCU for progressive care units. There's intensive care units, which are generally abbreviated ICU. Um, some institutions have flex beds, so a patient's status can change from intermediate care to ICU without patients physically moving, but you'll see in the ADT system that their status has been changed from IMC to ICU. Um, the intent is to capture ADT status and really nothing else. So if patients go from a lower level of care to a higher level of care, regardless of whether their room number changes, you want to capture that unexpected escalation of care. Um, the intent is not to capture a change in acuity outside of changes in ADT status. So if a patient, um, you know, if they're able to start a new IV medication or they're able to start a whatever, the patient needs more oxygen and they put them on BiPAP and they remain in an IMC bed, um, that is not captured in sequence 4140. This is really just looking at ADT status. Next slide. Um, oh, we missed 4220. Sorry. It's okay. Hospital, dis hospital discharge status. So um, this one uh, required a lot of conversation. We've been talking about this one for a little while. So patients that get discharged to hospice that remain alive longer than 30 days, there was a request um, to reevaluate whether we those patients need to remain coded as discharged to hospice. 
The reason being is that we all know that patients who are count who are discharged to hospice now get counted as mortalities. This question went back to the task force. Um, they appreciated very much the feedback from the group, but they decided to leave the definition as it it was originally made. It's consistent across the um, registries and aligns with the intent to capture all hospice discharges as mortalities, regardless of the patient's state of death. Um, so even if a patient were to survive past 30 days, they wouldn't expect that we would make a change in their discharge status. They remain as discharged to hospice and will get counted as a mortality. Next slide. So these are just some, um, I get some questions about sequence 4290, which is substance use screening and counseling. Um, so here's just a few polling questions that will hopefully help us talk through this a little bit. Um, my patient was screened for tobacco use, unhealthy alcohol use and drug use and does not currently use any of these substances. How would I code sequence 4290? I locked the poll, Ruth, I'll let you know. Thank you. How we're looking. All right. So again, the patient was screened for all three, did not use any of the above. All right. We got about 50, almost 60 responses still coming in. Still going. Give a couple more seconds. All right. Still coming in. All right. All right. Get five, four, three, two. All right. Let's go ahead. And then we got about 83 responses. And a little bit of everything. So the correct yes. answer is yes. The patient was screened for all three and does not use any of the above. And so there is no expectation for counseling to occur. You simply code yes to the sequence. Not applicable it is reserved for patients where they can't answer the questions or they, they would not be a candidate for counseling because of their mental status, for example. Um, is about the only example of not applicable that I can think of off the top of my head. So the correct answer to this one is yes. I have two more case scenarios for 4290. I know this one's an exciting sequence. Everybody loves it. <laughs> um, okay, my patient was screened for tobacco use, unhealthy alcohol use and drug use, and currently smokes two packs per day, but does not use alcohol or drugs. How do I code sequence 4290? Yes, no, not applicable. It would depend on whether there is documented counseling. Not sure. All right, uh, still coming in, Ruth. About 70 responses. Uh, oh, this is a good question, Ruth. <laughs> a couple more seconds. All righty. All right, we'll go ahead and end it. And there you go. So in this instance, it would depend on whether there's documented counseling. So the patient screened positive for something. So in order to know how to answer sequence 4290, the next step is gonna to be to look at whether counseling was completed um, because that'll guide your answer to the entire sequence. And let's go to the next question and, and then uh, I'll try to summarize and see if it's helpful. Um, so this question, the patient was screened for tobacco use, unhealthy alcohol use, and drug use, and currently smokes two packs per day, but does not use alcohol or drugs. There is no documentation of counseling for tobacco use. You looked and looked in the chart, and there's not. It's not there. How would you code 4290? Yes, no, not applicable. Phone a friend. Or submit an FAQ, because <laughs> I love FAQs. <laughs> Um, 70 people respond over in there. A couple more seconds. We have a, more of a consensus on this one. All right, go ahead and end it and share results. You're right, the answer is no. So the patient was screen positive and there's no documentation. So the answer to 4290, substance use screening and counseling is no. I think the hard part of this one is that it's sort of a two-part question, similarly to the way that reoperation is now structured. You have to think through, you know, first step, does the patient screen positive? If they don't screen positive, you're done. You just answer yes, because the screening got done. If they do screen positive, then you have to start looking around for counseling. Not applicable is very rarely the correct answer to this sequence. 
and please send me the FAQ if you have questions on that one. Um, one more quick update before we skip to Joe. I apologize. There were several people waiting for answers um, to questions that have gone to the core group and then have also gone to the task force. I need to do some additional follow-up with Dr. Cedar on those questions, but I will have answers for you very shortly. I apologize for the delay, but people who are waiting for those uh, answers um, are aware that they've gone to the task force um, and hopefully I'll have something for you by the end of the week. Thank, Thank you. For Thanks, Ruth. Uh, great job today. Um, all right. Um, I know um, we do not have any additional updates from um, Acuvia. Again, um, if you have any submitted tickets, they're under review. Um, if you need to follow up, please reach out with um, to tech support directly. Um, if you have outstanding questions, um, please feel free to put your ticket number um, into the Q&A and Joe and his team um, can take a look, look it up and provide you with an update. Um, but again, uh, feel free to either contact tech support directly or put your ticket number into the Q&A and Joe and team can get back, can get with you, try and get a response for you rather quickly while we are still on the call. Um, again, analysis report questions, again, follow up with tech support. Um, and tech support is as needed, we'll forge your questions on to tier two, um, STS um, as needed. My contact information is here. Feel free to email me or phone. Um, best way to get in touch with me is via email. Um, if you have any database operational questions, again, reach out to STSDB at STS.org. If you have questions regarding your contracts or direct data entry option or um, anything in general, if you're not sure who to contact, um, just reach out to me and I can get you in touch with the appropriate staff. Upcoming um, GTSD webinars, our next user group call is scheduled for June 22nd at 2.30 Central. And our next monthly webinar is July 13th at 1.30 Central. So um, after the release of the um, reports this month, we will be again uh, doing a walkthrough of the newly released report. Um, so I know we have some turnover, some new data managers. So um, we again, we'll have a, a presentation on our monthly webinar. Again, just a report, a walkthrough of the report um, and how to use the how to use the report, how to interpret some of the tables and graphs and things like that. So again, um, that will be scheduled for the July 13th um, webinar just after the release of the spring 22 reports. Um, that's all that I have for today. I know we've got some questions coming in. So let's go ahead and tackle those. Um, all right, Ruth, looks like most of these are gonna be for you. Um, so our first question, um, you wanna tackle this one? regarding sure. alcohol consumption. So the question is, if alcohol consumption meets alcohol abuse criteria as defined by sequence 790, but alcohol abuse is not documented, does the patient require substance use screening and counseling provided for alcohol use? So sequence 790 and sequence 4290 don't necessarily overlap. So for example, um, in sequence 790, a current cigarette smoker is defined as anyone who has smoked within the 30 days prior to admission. That's not necessarily true for 4290. The way that 4290 works is that your site is supposed to develop a process for screening and counseling um, patients. So the positive screen is defined by your site and it should be standard for all patients, but it's not based on sequence 790. So, um, I guess it's sort of an internal conversation that needs to happen at your institution to determine what your positive for 4290 is. And that's intentional. Um, although I know that it's um, a little bit cumbersome, I do think it's actually a great thing for patients for those conversations to occur internally, institutionally, so that they reap the maximum reward of great screening and counseling services being provided to them which is the intent of CMS, which is where these NQF measures um, come from. All right, um, next one. Um, again, another one for you, Ruth. I don't know if you wanna tackle this one or have it submitted. I am trying to read this quickly, Beth. Um, sequence 1510, primary lung cancer resection. Uh, path report is a left lower lobe lobectomy. It sounds like they're not sure if it's a lung primary or a MET. Um, current lung tumor is stage as if it's lung primary. I guess ask your surgeon whether, you're gonna have to ask your surgeon whether they, they 
consider this to be a lung cancer or whether they consider it to be metastatic disease and then just document their direction. Um, that way you, if you get audited, have appropriate um, backup for why the case was either included or excluded. Um, sometimes it's really hard. I mean, these cases occur and it's really sort of um, just needs to be an internal conversation with your surgeons and your pathologist when it's when it's indeterminate, they'll, they'll treat the patient based on what their best hunch sort of is. So go off their hunch and document it. Um, let's see next. Um, 16. Oh, did you skip? Okay. Um, can you review the calculation again for predicted percent and PFTs? Do you want to pull up that slide? It's probably easier yes. to use real numbers. And I saw uh, right above that, that um, someone had a suggestion for oh. clinic, just saying clinical staging methods, a little confusing. Um, are we going to have any discussion at AQO regarding clinical staging methods? We um, are. Yes. So, Thank you for the request. It's very helpful yes. when people let us know what they want to hear about at AQO. We'll spend more or less time on topics than, or um, present them. Yeah. Absolutely. Just let us know where you're struggling so we can gear our education, our AQO, all of our sessions towards, you know, what's most beneficial to you guys. All right, here you go, Ruth. So if you look in the blue box or at the bottom of this slide, this example actually came from the training manual. So the way that you're going to calculate your percent predicted is to take your actual number and divide it by your predicted number, which will give you a, a percentage, right? So 69.7% of predicted is this person's actual um, FEV1. If there was a, a number in the post bronchodilator column, you do the same thing. The predicted doesn't change for pre or post bronchodilator because the predicted is based on the patient's, um, I think, uh, sex at birth, uh, BMI, like height, weight. Um, I, I don't know all of the different things that go into creating that prediction, but the pre and post prediction will be the same. So you'll just need to, again, take your actual over your predicted to get your percent of predicted for your post. It's the same calculation, um, just with a different uh, numerator. Hopefully that helps. And that example, like I said, is in the um, the training manual with the, in the blue box, that example. Uh, the next question, what is the difference between 32607? Um, if you have the train or yeah, if you have the training manual or uh, probably the training manual is the best and want to pull it up. 32607 um, is the CPT code. It's a procedure. So what is the difference between 32607 thoracoscopy diagnostic with biopsy of lung infiltrate, e.g. wedge, unilateral, and 32608 thoracoscopy diagnostic with biopsy of lung nodules or masses, e.g. incisional, unilateral? Um, the names for these procedures include wedge and incisional in both and other places, um, and we didn't do that. Um, oh, they, it's weird. Your screen is like... Yeah, I don't know uh, what's happening. <laughs> Okay. I'm like, wait a minute. I can't. No, it's not. It's not weird. It's something weird. I have no idea what's going on. Let me, let me try and open it up. Okay. Um, so while she's trying to get this pull up, essentially the difference between 32607 and 32608 is the difference between infiltrate and nodule. So I use 32607 when they do a diagnostic wedge, primarily for things um, like patients who have been in the hospital for a long time and they can't quite figure out what's wrong, but they're not ventilating well looks like there's a bunch of infiltrates in their lungs. So they'll take them to the OR as sort of this, like, we've got to figure out what's going on with this patient and we can't ventilate them. Maybe they have horrible ILD or maybe there's some sort of an infection that we haven't diagnosed bronchoscopically. And so they'll do a wedge resection knowing that it's infiltrates. Um, so that's 4010-32607 right there at the top in the gray. 32608, I use when they do a diagnostic wedge resection of um, a nodule and it returns as a hamartoma or um, a granulomatous disease or when they, they know going in that there's like lung nodules everywhere and they think that it's probably granulomatous disease. Um, those are the cases where I use 32608 when it's truly nodules that they're biopsying versus um, infiltrates. 
which usually are ILD or some sort of weird pulmonary fibrosis, which is captured with 32607. Hopefully that helps. And I think it's a great topic for AQL too. Okay, perfect. All right. <clears throat> is there a code if they say they did a plexi of two lungs? I'm wondering if it's pexi that you're talking about. Um, uh, pexies aren't captured. So you wouldn't, there isn't a code for that. Um, there's gastropexy and pneumopexy and we don't capture either. Are the numbers in the example different from the blue box? So confused. Oh yeah, the numbers, yeah, that, sorry. Um, the slides will be posted. I'm sorry that the screen moves. Um, but these slides will be posted if that's helpful. Yes, the numbers in the blue box are is the example from the training report. Um, the the picture on the left is an actual PFT from a patient chart. Um, I didn't retype them. I'm sorry if that's confusing. Yeah, I can get that correct. If we can, can we get it? Do you want to get it corrected before we post it, or I don't know if it if it's if we can do that, but. Um, I can retype one in Word and insert it into the slide. That's fine. Okay. All of the, it's like they come from PDFs at my institution. So in order for me to get examples, I can't like play with numbers. I have to retype them, but that's all right. I don't want it to be confusing. I apologize. Um, oh, Mary has her hand raised. Let me see. I just saw that. Mary, I'm sorry. I, hope, I don't know how long your hand's been raised. Did you have a question? I think I unmuted you. You would just have to unmute yourself on your end. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. The question was if FEV1 equals 99%, shouldn't that just be the answer? In this, in this instance, where you only have one result, yes, FEV1 of 99% is the answer. If there was not a percent predicted listed, um, so let's say that their actual was for post bronco, let's say they did a post bronchodilator and it was um, five liters. You would take five divided by 4.63 and you're gonna get a percent of predicted greater than hundred. And then that would be your answer um, in that instance. The, the point of the, the, the image on the left was to demonstrate that in some instances, institutions don't give you a percent predicted for post bronchodilator and that you are permitted to calculate those. because what the training manual example currently shows is only a pre-bronchodilator. Um, and so institutions were unsure whether they were able to calculate it for a post-bronchodilator and the answer is yes, you can. And also to demonstrate that percent change can never be used in any of these calculations because it doesn't work mathematically. You always have to do the, the math if the percent of predicted is not um, given to you. Um, okay, okay. All right. I don't think Mary had a question. Her hand is lowered. Okay. Um, just also one other thing I wanted to point out um, regarding AQL, we will be having um, a new, another new data manager webinar um, prior to AQL. So we, we won't be having a new data manager um, session at AQL, but we, again, we will be having um, another new data manager webinar prior to AQO, which Ruth, uh, you and I need to get that scheduled. <laughs> so we need to put that on our calendar. Um, so again, I'll have a date for you. Um, our next our next monthly webinar, I'll have a date for you for our new, um, um, new data manager webinar. All right, um, so I just saw a question. Where is the, where did the question go? Where is the STS audit page located? So if you go to um, STS National Database from the homepage, go to the STS National Database page. And if you just scroll down, um, keep scrolling and you go under important resources, there's a, a link here for audits, click there. Um, and for each of the databases here for GTSD, click here. And then you have all of the 2020, 20, I can't say it, 2022 audit information. You have the audit instructions, um, sample for bookmarks, and all the FAQs are located here. And I think Emily also put a link in the chat box for anyone that wanted to go and perhaps bookmark that. Um, that's all. Let's see. Emily, 
Um, all right, I'm not seeing any additional questions. Um, again, our next webinars, let me get there real quick, are scheduled for June 22nd, our next user group call. And our next monthly is July 13th. I see Maggie's got her hand raised. Um, hey, Maggie, um, you may have to unmute on your end if you have a question. Yes, ma'am. Okay, couple of things. Um, with the substance use screening, so if a patient is not a current smoker because they've, they quit, say they quit smoking last September and they had their surgery today, then are, do they need counseling per STS's guidelines? I mean, is there some firm guideline from STS that we can use to determine that? Not or are you here. saying that every institution or healthcare system has to come up with some guideline on their own to say, if the patient is smoked within 30 days, yeah, we're going to counsel them. But if they've quit smoking and it's been greater than 30 days, they don't need counseling. I guess I'm just a little confused. So the... The CMS measure says that screening and counseling is specific to your hospital. So the STS made the decision not to determine your site-specific process for screening and counseling. If, if you've met your internal standard for documentation of screening and, it, and you've met your hospital standard, then you've met the, C, the STS standard. So you, like you have to determine for your site what a positive screen is so that you know whether to look for counseling or not. Okay, because it's kind of the same thing with alcohol use in the one um, sequence where it asks, you know, do they have a history of alcohol abuse? And it gives a certain number of drinks per week that would indicate that. So those sequences up above are completely different than sequence 4290. Okay. So you can't take the 790 definitions and apply them to 4290 automatically. If your site chooses to do so, you absolutely can, um, but you don't have to, right? So at our institution, we can say, you know what? The STS has defined in 790 that they're going to count people who've smoked in the last 30 days as current smokers. Um, and for, for that sequence, that is the definition. Somebody smoked in the last 30 days, the STS requires that I code that as a current smoker. And that's the way that that field would be audited for, for the field 790. 4290, we can, we can make a decision that they're not smoking today, we're not gonna do counseling. And if that's our institutional decision and we have that process documented, then that's what the STS is gonna look for um, when you get audited specific to 4290. So the, the, the sequences don't overlap, if that okay. makes sense. Kind of. <laughs> um, then I have a question about previous surgeries in a particular anatomical space. Mm -hmm. So if a patient's had like a previous um, abdominal hysterectomy, mm -hmm. that's in the pelvic cavity. So for a hiatal hernia, you would say, no, there's no previous surgery in the abdominal cavity, correct? Even though they're like really close to each other, but it's a separate cavity, is that? If it's listed as a separate cavity, um, pelvic, yeah, so yeah, no, it would be, well, I'm just, it would not be the same cavity, you're correct. Okay, okay, and gosh, I had one other question, but now I can't remember what it was. Um, and for AQO, I still am just really struggling with size of a lesion because I don't get a lot of information whether or not something's a mixed density lesion. You know, in the CT scan report or on my surgeons, H&P, they're just saying you have a 1.5 or a 2 centimeter lesion. They don't always say it's partially ground glass or it's all ground glass or if, you know, it's a, a nodule and I'm taking that a nodule would be solid. But I mean, is that the case? I, I don't know. And I honestly, 
you know, if we ever get audited, I have no idea how we're going to come out on size of lesions because I don't feel like I have a lot of that information coming from my radiology reports or my surgeons. It, it may be helpful to follow up with your surgeons and I'm sure you probably already have, but just said like, this is the expectation that we're documenting size in this way. That's how it's used for clinical staging. So they know the answer to that question um, for every patient before they do the resection. It may just be a matter of them um, needing to help you out by documenting that specific piece of information, which isn't uncommon, right? Like I've gone to my surgeons and said, for the life of me, I can't figure out whether y'all have done X, Y, Z in your op notes. Every time I'm like digging through a hundred things, trying to find this, can you help me? And like, lo and behold, it started showing up as like a numbered thing at the top of my report. And I was like, oh, thank you so much. Hiatal hernia type. That's what it was. Whether well, it was a one, two, three, four, I used to like right. spend hours trying to figure that out. And, and I finally, I was just like, can you help me? And they were like, yeah, of course. And now it's just there. So having well, that and our surgeons, might be helpful. I don't know. Our surgeons are extremely responsive. They, they're wonderful. They truly yeah. are. But if they're in their note, if it says this is, you know, 1.5 centimeter lesion, should I just accept that at face value and not be like, well, it, was, it a, was this the solid component of this? Or if that's how they're staging it, because I don't even attempt to, you know, stage these. Like the staging guidelines that you have listed, I feel like that's totally beyond really my expertise. And I always go back to ask them, you know, you know, we didn't see clinical staging. Can you figure that out for me? So if they're saying that, should I just accept that at face value? I think you should ask not, them what they, I think you should ask them what they mean when they say that, right? And they may, they may say, oh, unless we say it's uh, subsolid or unless we say it's ground glass, where like solid is implied, right? Um, and then you have that communication to, for your record, right? Um, but I think they'll be able to provide you the best guidance on how to do that. We're definitely covering clinical staging at AQO. There's gonna be a big, um, it's a big topic of focus. Um, so there, that will be covered there as well. But I- Because the other thing is when there's multiple, I mean, mm -hmm. multiple CT scans, you know, there's the PET CT and then the CT and then the CT closest to surgery. And then I have what the surgeon says. And they don't always, in fact, they frequently don't all kind of like match up to like one happy golden mm -hmm. number that mm -hmm. this is the size of your lesion. Um, yeah, they never do. And honestly, <laughs> by the end of the day of abstracting thoracic, I could just shoot myself. Um, I think <laughs> I think there's some direction on which one to pick when there's more than one, but um, hang on, I'm digging through the training manual real quick. I think it just talks about when there's, like if there's one that's greater than like six months old and you have one that's like newer than six months old, that if I have two or three that fall into that time frame. I understand the question. I'll look into it some more and I'll try to provide some additional clarification in here. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for the question. Yeah, thanks, Maggie. Thanks for the discussion. We appreciate it. Um, okay, Ruth, we've got two more questions and then we've got a, a couple more minutes. Um, my next question, does the counseling have to be oral or does handing out educational material um, considered enough to mark yes for the STS database? Um, I don't believe that there's anything in this sequence that indicates that it has to be verbal counseling. Oh. Um, I think that it's, yeah, I agree it's, your, it's your hospital standard. Yeah. So your, yeah. your hospital yeah. needs to it. Yeah, the handouts are fine. Yep. Okay. Let's see. Our last question from Beth. I too am confused with alcohol abuse. If an HMP doesn't list it, but the per the STS training manual, a patient meets abuse 
I have not been marking yes to counseling as a provider never addressed that the patient has a problem. If so, in that instance, I think uh, it seems like marking no would be correct because I think what you're saying, Beth, is that the patient was never screened. So if your patient wasn't screened, then you have to mark no. Um, but if your patient was screened and your provider said, nope, they don't have alcohol abuse, then that's, that's fine. They're using your institution's definition of alcohol abuse. They don't have to use the STS definition from sequence seven, 790. Right. It has to be, a, that's, I agree, Ruth. It has to be, and it, I wouldn't just pay attention to the HMP. I would look for other um, screening processes in place. So if they have an actual screening when the patient is admitted for alcohol use or for tobacco or um, on uh, not prescribed drug use, I would look for those screenings. And if those screenings are uh, signify that the patient requires counseling, and they required count and they received counseling, if it's handouts or uh, verbal code, yeah, yes, that they met that they met that field. And if the counseling wasn't um, wasn't provided or the patient, uh, then you would code no. That's a great point, Carol. A lot of, um, of hospitals have a standard process for this screening at the time of admission, and that's absolutely allowable screening documentation because that's the process that your institution set up. Right, and it's also a, uh, just to the screening for smoking, the screening for alcohol abuse, and I believe screening for drug abuse is one of the process measures that CMS has in place. So if you are doing uh, core measures for your hospital, if you're abstracting core measures or somebody's abstracting core measures, check with them to see if there's already a screening in place that you should be using to verify against um, how you're coding for the uh, general thoracic database. Suzanne's question, if my patient is a current snuff user, but my providers do not have any requirements for counseling, if the patient is an inactive smoker, then I can code yes to the substance abuse counseling question. So. No, this is kind of the whole point of this question is that the patient was, um, the patient was uh, met the need for counseling according to this measure and they did not receive the counseling required. And that's one of those things that you would bring to your surgeons or your, you know, whomever is not providing that counseling and address with them. Do you agree, agree with that, Ruth? Um, I'm trying to understand Suzanne's question. I think she's saying that at her site, they don't define snuff as tobacco use. Um, so then they wouldn't screen positive, right? I guess I'm, I might not be understanding the question. Uh -uh. Um, Suzanne, if you're, I don't know if you're available, if you wanted to clarify. Okay, they never counsel unless it's for actual smoking. Um, but what's their definition of tobacco use. So I think you have to start there. So they have to define tobacco use first. So don't, you can't start at counseling and look backwards. You first have to decide, define what screens a patient in positive for tobacco use, alcohol use, and drug use. And then once you know that, then you can look for counseling for those things, right? So they need to have some sort of definition of what abuse is or what screens you positive. And it's, it's likely already defined at your institution because this overlies other requirements. You may just need a copy of it and it might be getting done um, inpatient as part of like standard nursing care, for example, um, or your discharging provider might be doing it. Um, we're a couple of minutes over, so just one, um, just Maggie just wanted to know if it had to be done in the hospital setting. And then I think, I know I've got need to be respectful of time. I know other people have, I know people have other meetings to get to, so. Um, Maggie, I don't believe so, but if you want to send it in as an FAQ, I'm happy to clarify it definitively and put that in the training manual. Perfect. 
All right. Um, excellent call today, Ruth. Great job, great education um, provided. So I appreciate it. Um, thank everyone. Uh, thank you everybody for joining. Again, just a reminder, our next user group calls June 22nd at 2.30 Central. Um, thank you everyone for joining today. I hope you guys have a great rest of the week. Have a wonderful weekend. And um, we'll see you again on the 22nd. Excellent call today, Ruth. Thanks, Leanne. Thank you guys. Thanks everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, Christine. Have a great, have a great weekend.